21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. I don't know if you know, but actually earlier today was uh, we were named, or me and my co-founders and Indica were named uh, Forbes 30 Under 30. Um, so we can no, kind of No, I did not that. know. Wow, congratulations. Yes, yeah, so that dropped like two hours ago. So thank you. Where are you situated, yes. by the way? Uh, right now, I'm right outside of Boston. In, uh, oh, Summer nice, Park, Boston, nice. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, I like it. Um, so why why Boston? Are you born in Boston? Are you, are, did, did you move to Boston? So, I came out here for school. I was born actually in LA on the other side of the country. And I think like every 18 year old, right? I wanted to get as far away from home as possible. <laughs> so I, I moved to the opposite side of the country. Um, and I, I really fell in love with it out here. I think one of the things that really um, feels good to me about Boston is that in the US, there's not a lot of good public transit, uh, you know, very different from Europe. Uh, and Boston happens to be one of the few cities that does have really good public transit. And that's, that's a lot of why I settled here, honestly. I heard that uh, retail prices are so low in California, so low, low in, in LA and San Francisco. You can buy a house for peanuts. <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke, right? That's a it good, is a joke. That's a, I like that one. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure someone feels that way. You know, that's why people keep buying the houses, right? But uh, maybe from yeah, China no. and Russia. Yeah, right, exactly. It's at least worth holding on to the, the real estate, right? But um, no, I mean, I think that's the thing. I think that one of the things I really like about the US now is it used to be that, you know, there was just this incredible focus on, you know, really just San Francisco, you know, maybe New York. And now you've seen, especially since the pandemic, right, this huge resurgence of sort of the second and third kind of tier cities that are not as big, but also have more manageable cost of living because people are realizing, hey, this is actually a great place to live. And any interesting things regarding Boston? I mean, I think Boston, you know, obviously it's a very historical town, right? Um, yes. You know, there's a really nice climbing scene around here, which I really appreciate. Um, and, you know, uh, it, you know, my, my school, Olin College of Engineering, I really appreciate that's also nearby. So I think that, you know, there's a really strong, obviously, academic culture in Boston. And I think that while, you know, people usually think immediately of sort of the biotech space, the biomedical space, and I mean, that's that's huge, right? And obviously, sort of the, you know, biotech in Boston is amazing. Boston, Boston Dynamics, uh, any any other big companies? Oh, that too. Except, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think the thing is, you know, every big company almost has some branch in Boston, right? Oh, so, really? you know, AWS and Google and Microsoft, right? Everyone's got an office in Boston, oh. right? But it's all sort of um, option value, I would say. Uh -huh. um, you know, so I would say, I, I don't know, I, I really like it. I think there's a lot of really good talent around Boston. Obviously, it's key. And what I like to say is uh, Boston fuses all the good things about a big city and a small town, in my mind is that you've got all the great, you know, amenities and it's a very, very kind of a, both a modern and a historic city, but also you run into people that you know just all over the place. Oh, the that's, that's of the city is not For that the large. states, that's, that's amazing. I mean. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, it, you know, while there are a lot of minuses about Boston, right? I think that the roads, for instance, are not laid out in a really sensible way. Um, there's a lot of pluses and a lot of things to like about Boston as well. We're actually primarily focused on the enterprise. So, you know, sort of the Fortune 500, you know, banking, oh, okay. financial services, insurance. Uh, so, you know, companies like like MetLife is a is an example, you know, really large customer of ours. Um, so, yeah, so we, we definitely work, uh, you know, we're we're about 70 people now. So we're definitely oh. growing, but, you know, not not huge, but but definitely uh, underway now, I think, at this point. But we, I think, are moving further and further into the large enterprise. We're starting to realize that um, there's a really good resonance uh, of our product there. And what was the difference between you being solopreneur and being entrepreneur now with the 70, 70 plus people in your organization? Oh gosh, I mean, what's what's not different, right? Oh yeah, you know, no, I mean, I I remember, um, you know, I, 
I will say, you know, way, way back in the day, right, when we were, you know, two or four people, right, in a dorm room, right, I just remember absolutely everything was, you know, I am literally doing this, I'm bringing it to the end, right, I'm reading securities law, I'm figuring out what documents do we have to file with, you know, what, what departments, right, um, you know, I'm doing the accounting, right, I'm doing the modeling, right, I'm doing the pitching, I'm doing absolutely everything. And the way that our, our you know, current CEO likes to, likes to say it is, Every stage, right? Every step that you take forward, it's a question of what hat am I going to take off and give to mm-hmm. someone else? Um, and I think that's one of the things that's really, really interesting. And there was this big change around, around the Series A, I would say. So as we were kind of hitting product, product market fit, where the most valuable thing I could do was no longer to go and actually build the thing, right? Uh-huh. You know, for, for the whole time up until that point, you know, it's very much be a doer. There's not, you know, a lot of folks to pick it up. So it's just, you know, get stuff done, make progress. And it started to become much more um, strategic orientation, right? It was actually, interestingly, it was a lot more valuable for me to not do something and set someone up to be able to do it themselves then going forward. And I think that, you know, that was definitely a very difficult shift for me. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest shift. And uh, your guys, they, are they uh, thinking as entrepreneurs as well? What's the, what's their no, mindset? I, or is it a no, classic it, organization yeah. now? So no, it's definitely not a classic organization, right? I think that we've got our own own flavor to it, right? I think something that we, you know, I often say is like, um, you know, I, I think making a company is about the hardest thing that you can possibly do. Right. And a lot of the folks that we've got, certainly throughout our leadership position, right, they are founders, right? And they are people with both experience at very large companies, but every single one of them has been through the startup journey from you know very, very early stages, right? So they have that. You know, but you know, I I would say that um what I think Indico is really characterized um is not while some people might frame this as the entrepreneurial mindset, we're really framed by uh, dramatically open communication, I think. Mm-hmm. So the way that we like to think about it uh, almost more than that is to say that, because the people joining today, right, at 70 people, um, is a very just different kind of person than makes sense to join when we're five people, right, or uh-huh. 10 people or 20 people even, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say those early people, right, you know, that's kind of tremendously entrepreneurial. And even the people today, right, you know, that's also entrepreneurial, but in a, in a kind of fundamentally different way, I would argue. So the thing that has stayed constant about Indico is this notion that we don't know who the best answer has, right? Everyone is sort of the leader in their own uh, domain for a particular, you know, part of the platform, right? People care very much about making sure the customer has a good end experience, right? And I think that when you look at our core values, one thing that's really important to us that we really try to uh, emphasize with everyone is this value of ownership. So the idea of, and and this I think in a lot of ways is almost the delta between a startup and a big company, right? Is that when, when you see something has to get done, not jumping to, oh great, and someone else is going to do it. Say, hey, you know, I, I'm gonna volunteer to be point and actually responsible for making sure this gets across the finish line. And I think really cultivating the kinds of folks that get a lot of fulfillment from that. Who owns the pain when, when somebody screws up? <laughs> No, I mean, it, so I think that we we generally collectively own the pain. I think that what we really try to say is that um, we do a really good job hiring, I believe, right? So I think if you go into every situation with the assumption that you've got a world-class team around you, the question that you've really got to ask when something goes wrong is, okay, uh, A, let's diagnose it together, right? Let's do this group retrospective, try to figure out what happened, what went wrong. And then really importantly, try to think more about, okay, from a process perspective, what can we actually change to make sure this doesn't happen in the future? Um, Because I think the other thing is, you know, it's almost at every point, in your journey as a company, you're, you know, the, the most qualified, you know, most excellent group of people that's going to exist at that point, because you're going to get, you know, bigger, and, you know, the expertise will be more diluted in the future. Um, So it's actually kind of a really, really good time to set those processes up immediately after you stub your toe, right? It's kind of the best time to do it. Is it the agile or some other project management method? You know, we it's our own flavor of agile, oh, okay. you know, I think kind of, kind of like everyone else. Right. I think that we, we call it agile and to some extent it is, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think in, in practice, it's pretty blended um, just, you know, 
SML company stuff comes up. And so our ability to really maintain a pure agile methodology, it's like not quite there. You know, there's actually quite a high overhead, I think, in, in having a really pure agile methodology. And, and even, you know, at our scale today, we're still not really there yet, frankly. I'm asking because of the potential sprints you have. Yeah, so so we do have sprints. So that we've definitely taken on from the Agile methodology, right? So we, we do try to keep things in these sprints and epics and releases, right? And we've got a pretty reasonable setup along that. Um, but, you know, I would say that one of the challenges in building AI is that our systems are very, very interconnected. So our ability to just kind of shave off individual features, um, it's limited, right? Even even now, you know, and yeah. I think it's better now than it was seven years ago. But even today, right? You know, touching the ETL over here, you know, it changes the models, right? It changes yeah. the UI, yeah. right? And you you see this ripple effect, which makes it hard to have sort of a pure agile methodology. Can you even have VAs, or you can only have full time employees, or the, what's the organizational model? Yeah, so we uh, primarily for like the core platform. Yeah, because it's I mean, it's it's very tricky, right? You yeah, know, it and is. We're, we're that's, all... that's the reason why I'm asking so much questions. Ex exactly. About and... Yeah. So so yeah, so we don't have that on on the actual engineering side. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, course, just yeah. because I mean, honestly, even getting uh, actually the the mentality we've even taken on internally is that the stuff that we're doing is weird enough that it's very rare to find someone that's got a lot of experience in the thing that we're doing. Even folks with like AI experience, we're working on like a weird little offshoot of AI. Um, so we instead optimize very much for like someone who's really interested, someone who's very hungry and someone who are con confident is going to get up to speed, you know, in three to six months and be really excited about that journey. Um, because, you know, even, even like, you, and then that's like a, a very, very, you know, competent developer we're starting with. Um, so yeah, so it, we do we do do that. We do have um, a data labeling team um, that you know that's got more part time folks, but even still, then it's kind of a long term relationship because we've got sort of a a special way of doing things. I'd say we're you know we're always looking for places where we can kind of rely on third parties to do portions of it, but you know we usually have to be. I guess the way that we do it is it's, it's sort of very leadership driven because mm. the vast majority of our work is not a good fit. It's more like we find, oh, hey, this is a good fit. Actually, you know, this is like a nice, you know, sequestered piece of work. We could do that and we could have, you know, an agreement for that. And then we'll kind of really proactively find someone for that engagement. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, we've got someone on uh, UX, for instance, like a really important and impactful UX cycle. Um, and then we've also got a couple of folks on uh, sort of customer ops, right? Mm. What's your biggest uh, obstacle or obstacles uh, for growth? Lifeware, software, hardware, money? <laughs> yeah, so actually I think thankfully money is not really our issue right now mm -hmm. you know always you know if you give me 100 developers right like we can we can do a, a lot of good stuff with 100 <laughs> sure. developers <laughs> right yeah. uh, but but you know i would say it's it's not really the limiting factor for us right now i think the the hardest thing for us and uh you know i think this is true for a lot of companies is really getting the sales process like locked down Right. Wow. It's it's a very new product. It's kind of a new way of selling. And what we're finding is that while we've had, you know, some success selling in a more traditional way. Um, is it a consultative uh, sales or what kind of sales? It's uh, I'll say it's a highly of... educational sales oh, okay. process. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not very services heavy. Right. So we're not we're not kind of bundling a lot of pro serve in with these. Um, but we are having to educate the customers often quite a lot on just, uh, you know, we're in a very frothy space. There's a lot of different competitors and, or, you know, folks that appear to be competitors often at first, but aren't actually competitors because it's reasonably confusing. So a lot of what we have to help customers just understand is how do you even evaluate these vendors? Um, how do you understand what's actually a fit for your, your use case and how do you tell? Because believe it or not, the most common outcome of a bake-off where we didn't really help someone, you know, understand how to run a good bake-off is no decision, right? Which is, which is crazy if you think about it, right? Because, you know, uh, if you've constructed a good bake-off, 
uh, you should have a decision. E even if it's not us, our kind of point of view is, you know, let's at least help you make, uh, you know, get to a real decision. Okay, Slater, now about you. Okay, Business yeah. journey, life journey, journey per se, ups and downs, pitfalls. Oh my gosh. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, here I can, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Indico and maybe, you know, sort of how I got into, into all this mess. Um, and, and I'll say sort of heading into uh, college, right? I was very much not the sort of person I think that, certainly I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I went into undergrad, uh, I had never owned my own computer. Um, I thought I was going to be a chemical engineer. Uh, and I believed that entrepreneurship was a euphemism for unemployment. And I thought that's all that it meant. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah, I grew up course. in LA and, and there's no entrepreneurs in LA really at all. Um, so I came over to Boston, right? And I came to school and I realized a few things pretty quickly. A is that while I love chemistry, uh, the career path of chemical engineering was not really exciting to me. It was a lot of school and a lot of probably uh, working on oil rigs for, you know, long periods of time. So I'm like, thanks, but no thanks, right? Uh, and I, I was actually lucky enough to, you know, there's a mandatory software class you have to take your, your uh, first semester at school. And I absolutely loved it. You know, it was it was love at first sight. And from about the that point forward, from the time I picked up this Java book, uh, I coded an average of twelve hours a day for the next you know two and a half three years. Um, so that was just how much. And and it was not even so much that that was uh, required by my classes. I actually was taking very few you know nominally programming courses. But uh, the way my school works is everything is project based. So I found a way to sort of empower everything I was doing with my programming. I found a way to kind of twist the classes to give me an excuse to code more, uh, which, you know, I obviously I loved. Um, so, you know, fast forward a little bit, uh, my, you know, as all kind of young hungry hungry programmers do, you know, you encounter machine learning as this really cool space, right? You know, you've heard about AI and you're like, all right, you know, great, maybe I can poke into that. Uh, and I sort of fell backwards into an AI project uh, at my first internship at Pearson. And I was lucky enough to get, you know, sort of a very good result and hit a state of the art on a, on a particular problem. I'm like, this is great. You know, I felt really, really good with my, you know, very, very traditional ML techniques. Um, you know, this was not deep learning or anything. And actually, I was feeling so good when I came back for my sophomore year. You know, I sat down with one of my professors and I said, and this is 2012, by the way, uh, I said, the war is over, deep learning lost. Right. Uh, and it's, I was I was completely certain. Right. Uh, in this kind of point of view. Uh, and in 2012, that was not actually a particularly strange point of view to have. Um, right. And then I started to. Uh, because it had not shown any results, uh -huh. right? I think that people, you know, people see today deep learning is all the rage and everyone uses it for everything, right? But they forget that when you go back to 2012, there were really three universities in the world that were doing significant research into deep learning because everyone else had written it off, really. Uh. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some, some asterisks to that, you know, some grad students, but, you know, the amount of research that you saw going into this field even 10 years ago was... I mean, it was almost non-existent. Can you can you compare and then continue with your journey? So uh, back mm. then and now regarding voice recognition or some other things that we normal people understand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the one of the most shocking uh, examples I can use is ImageNet. Um, uh -huh. And so this is a very classic uh, test for image recognition. So the idea is we have a thousand images in a thousand classes, you know, everything you can think of planes, trains, cars, you know, 70 different dog breeds, right? So it's just supposed to be this very, very broad, very generic uh, image recognition task, right? Uh, and 
humans are about, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to measure it, but for, you know, some, some key metrics, humans are about 95% accurate. And when this was originally made in uh, 2009, I think was the first uh, public year, this was supposed to be sort of a, a centuries long challenge, right? Something that we would never ever accomplish, right? That once we had, you know, gotten to this human level of efficacy, we would have solved, uh, you know, computer vision. Um, and, you know, for a couple of years, it certainly seemed that way. You know, we didn't use deep learning and it was sort of this very, very kind of incremental, all right, chipping away at it, chipping away, but still, you know, way, way, way worse than humans. And then 2012, people kind of jokingly call it uh, the shot heard around the world, the AlexNet paper, which is now uh, maybe one of the most widely cited papers uh, ever in, you know, any field, right? But certainly I believe the, the most cited paper uh, in machine learning. Uh, was this entry to ImageNet that resulted in just a, an absolutely dramatic, you know, insane uh, improvement in the efficacy. You know, it was like a halving of the error rate. Uh, and in fact, the improvement was so dramatic. And this is always how science works, right? Is the initial breakthrough is really interesting, but it's actually the stuff after that that is really impactful. And it and the rate of advancement from that point forward, and that was 2012 when AlexNet was released, that by uh, 2017, I believe, we were so good at the ImageNet problem uh, that the creators of ImageNet actually said, okay, um, this is no longer useful. Um, we have solved this problem, right? Uh, and, and that was 100% deep learning, right? And, and that was basically what happened was that deep learning was so radically effective that really in a couple of years, this problem that was supposed to be, you know, decades or even a century of work uh, was solved. And now, of course, that, that it turns out that doesn't actually mean that we've solved, uh, you know, AI in any kind of meaningful way. You know, it's just sort of highlighted that we've got that much more, uh, you know, to go. But you see this sort of across across these fields, right? You see that in, in speech recognition, right? You see that in natural language processing. You see it in computer vision, right? Uh, problems that we did not think we would see solved in our lifetimes are now the building blocks of new systems where we're you know, making significant strides towards more uh, significant intelligence than, than we were even imagining a couple of years ago. Let's go back to your 2012 and continue. Yeah, absolutely. So um, have you ever heard of Kaggle? No. So Kaggle is this crowdsourced data science competition. So the idea is that companies come, they upload their data sets, right? And whoever gets the best accuracy wins some cash prize. Uh -huh. um, so me and Alec Radford, um, my co-founder, we started doing these Kaggle competitions together. Uh, and this was really how I became convinced of deep learning. This is how I learned that I was wrong. You know, for the first six months or so that we were competing together, these traditional techniques, they were working really, really well. You know, Alec was still, you know, thinking a lot about deep learning, right? He was working on these techniques and I'm like, all right, you know, that's kind of cute, but you know, I'll be doing the real work over here. Uh, but the thing was that after the first six months, I never made another winning submission again, right? The traditional techniques you know, we got to see in this very, very tangible way when deep learning really came out ahead, you know, as we learned to use these techniques really productively. And, you know, when it went from, okay, you know, it's very difficult now to use these techniques, we don't know where they're effective and where they're not, to now where, you know, I might argue that in almost every domain in machine learning, these deep learning techniques are so much more effective than traditional techniques that you really, uh, have to be using them in some capacity in your system, uh, you know, if accuracy and efficacy are important, even from just a, you know, responsibility perspective. After I was convinced of this deep learning technology, right, I decided it was, it was time to switch horses, right? And we started asking ourselves this question, okay, uh, we're convinced uh, with the promise of this technology, we've sort of seen what is possible here. Uh, what is now preventing people from actually effectively making use of that technology? And that really was the genesis of Indico, right? And it was, you know, it was really quite a bold statement. You know, there we were, you know, sophomores, juniors, uh, you know, an undergraduate in, you know, arguably one of the hardest areas of software that exists, uh, saying, hey, um, not only are we going to work in this field, uh, but we're going to meaningfully advance the state of the art and do it in a way that is uh, responsible. And I would say that we were tremendously successful for that. Right. You know, I, I say that the first iteration of Indico, we redefined the way that developers access, you know, these uh, machine learning APIs. 
uh, we you know really set a new standard for how usable these products should be. Um, and then you know in Indico V2 we really uh, and that's when we brought on CEO. Uh, Tom Wild and I stepped uh, to the CTO role. Um, that was really when we shifted over towards the enterprise and started saying, okay, we can actually be even bolder with our vision, make this accessible even to non-technical people, sort of the citizen data scientist. Uh, and, you know, the rest is history. And, and I think that was the shift that really, really kind of propelled us towards success. And was it a, a good history, positive one? You know, I, I learned a lot, you know, there's a lot of positives to it. Um, but I mean, it, it was tough, right? I mean, you know, we did, we did have to pivot, you know, our first business model didn't work. Uh, we had to recap the company. Uh, and while, you know, again, there were a lot of successes, I think we built a lot of really amazing technology, right? You know, we, we punched really high above our weight class for a startup like we were. Um, you know, we were we were too early uh, to an industry, frankly, right? And I think that was that was a bit tough, right? Is now now our industry is early, right? You know, seven eight years ago when we were getting started, it was you know embryonic. Do you have any reference point uh, when speaking about your company or some other companies? Definitely. So I think that the the best analogy I can use for AI, and I think this is a. Uh, this is something that people get wrong uh, often, right? Is AI is not some objective, you know, independent arbiter of truth, right? It, it's very much not like that. So actually a better analogy for AI is a mirror, um, uh -huh. but it's it's not a perfect mirror. It's sort of like a mirror with a hundred different pockmarks uh, all across the surface, right? And the thing is, you're going to uh, shine a light at it. You know, you're going to show it something. And that's something you show it. That's data. You know, that's your historic data. You know, us as humans, whatever you've been doing here historically, that's what you're showing to the mirror. And it's going to shine it back at you. And it's it's mostly going to be right. You know, it's mostly going to reflect whatever you, you gave it. But uh, there's going to be gaps, right? There's going to be pieces that it sort of ignores. There's going to be pieces that it magnifies a little bit. It, right so it's a little bit imperfect as it shines back but it is first and foremost a reflection of what we give it not some independent arbiter that will kind of uh, solve our problems for us and i think that's something uh especially you know if we talk about kind of bias in ai which is a really important and relevant topic uh something that people often miss is that actually the first step and the most important step is effectively defining in, in human terms, right, even put AI to the side for a second, you know, what does something that's unbiased look like? That's a very hard discussion to have, right? But once we do that, actually, it's not, it's not too difficult to think to build an AI that actually operates effectively. It just turns out that coming up with that initial definition, right, or, or even recognizing that, hey, maybe our historic data is biased, right, and, and asking that question, okay, how do we fix it? What would it mean to fix it? Right. So I think that that then becomes the more interesting and, and difficult question. Can we continue uh, with that topic? Uh, and if, if you can share any concrete business problem issue that you can, you Definitely. know, your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think the I'll use the very public example of the Amazon resume reviewer, right? Because I think it's just, it's a perfect example and it's public and people can kind of look up the details if they want to know more. Uh, so in 2018, I want to say, uh, Amazon came out and said, okay, everyone, we're turning off our AI powered resume reviewer. Uh, and everyone's sort of like, wait, you had a, you had an AI powered resume reviewer, right? Um, and the story there is actually very interesting because you know, Amazon reasonably, they wanted to speed up the efficiency with which they review resumes. And this is really on the initial screen. So you send a resume into, you know, their, their web form or whatever, and do you get a call back or not? So obviously it's, you know, it's important. These are employment decisions being made. Um, and they just trained it on their historic data on, did we reach out to this person or not? Um, and very quickly, actually, because this was now in a place where they were now measuring the outcomes, they started uh, realizing that it was, you know, highly, highly biased. Right. And the specific bias that they picked up on was this you know, really extreme gender bias. Right. And they like really could not get this thing to say it was OK to let women through the hiring pipeline. They're like, this is weird. Um, so what Amazon decides to do, and I think this is where the story gets really interesting, is they decide, OK, the AI is broken. 
right? And that's, uh, you know, with the, the way that a lot of people think about it, that's a really reasonable assumption. So they go, they get, you know, a whole bunch of the world's top PhDs, right? And they say, fix it, you know, fix our AI, make it better. Uh, and they frame it as a modeling problem, as a machine learning problem. And so, uh, you know, this team, they dig deep into, you know, like what's going on in the model, you know, what could we possibly do to fix it? They find these weird quirks. It's just like, oh, you know, because of the random sample we took, uh, you know, everyone from Smith College and Smith College is a very, very good, you know, sort of all all girls school uh, or, you know, women's college, I should say, uh, in the United States. But, you know, one quirk of the model was it would just flat out reject anyone from Smith College. Um, and, and that's, you know, a little bit what I'm talking about with the little, you know, pockmarks on the mirror, right? It's these little just random things that they're probably small in terms of the whole river of data that Amazon has looked through. You know, it's maybe a tenth of a percent of the applicants are from Smith. But, you know, obviously that's bad, both for Amazon and obviously for folks from Smith College. And it, it's pretty impactful. Uh, but then what happens is, you know, for two years, basically, these PhDs work on the system and they work on the system and they whack on it and, you know, they, they're, you know, tweaking every hyperparameter they can think of. Uh, and their fundamental conclusion is this problem is not solvable, huh. right? And so they, they come back and they say, look, our conclusion is that there's no amount of tweaking that we can do to this model that is going to make it not biased. Um, we need non-biased data and a definition of what it means for our data to be non-biased in order to make progress. Mm. Uh, and Amazon says, okay, that's very interesting. Um, so, and then th this leads us to the actual press release where they have now two options, right? They can either, um, you know, keep measuring their system, right? And continue trying to improve it over time, or they can turn the AI off, right? They can go back to the old system where, they haven't actually solved any of the issues with bias, right? But they're no longer measuring it. And so there's no longer the onus to solve it. And so that's really what they ended up doing, right? And I think that's what a lot of people end up doing, right? Is that AI is sort of this mirror and they say, hey, we want to use it on our resume process. And when it shines back to you, you know, it's got its own imperfections, but also we might not be very happy with what we see. And, you know, I think it's very easy in that case to blame the mirror, right? Blame the AI, be like, oh, you know, like, why are you making these wrong decisions? When really, you know, you're the one that that did that, right? It's just the mirror. Um, and so that's, you know, I think kind of a classic case where, uh, and then and then in, um, in Amazon's case, right, again, the way they solved it was even to break the mirror, right? And they're like, okay, we're not actually gonna fix our problem. We're just gonna break the mirror because then we don't have to think about it. What about fake mirrors? I mean, that's that's one of the uh, fake is one of the mm. buzzwords of uh, yeah of 2021 and yeah. So actually, one of the things that's really uh, you know worth noting here. So Indico was actually we were the authors on the uh, DC GAN paper, which one which was one of the very first kind of realistic uh, fake articles out there. You know, for building yeah. these fake. Uh, faces and, and images and things along those lines. And I think this is, um, I think this is one of the biggest, you know, most real threats out there. You know, I think that uh, for now, our ability to distinguish fakes from, you know, reality, actually, humans are pretty bad at this, it turns out, unless you train them. Um, models are, are significantly better at it. Um, but it's still difficult to use these techniques, right? It's difficult to train them in a realistic way and use them effectively and productively. There's still a lot of manual configuration and manual oversight that's required. But in practice, what that means is just that the expense is really high. And, and that actually makes things a little bit scarier because it means that the folks that you see kind of dipping their toe into this technology are state actors. Um, so, you know, for instance, and not a lot of people know this, but we've actually already seen the first examples of deep fakes being used in sort of government, uh, I don't know, cyber warfare sounds a little yeah. bit dramatic, right? But at least, you know, information warfare, right? Um, where I, I want to say it was uh, one of the, there was a fake 
profile that was reputed to, you know, like verify the Hunter Biden laptop or something along those lines. Um, and the thing was just like fake from top to bottom, right? It was a fake person from a fake university, you know, an image of a face that never existed, that was generated actually, I believe, by DC Gan. Um, and, and it, you know, it was probably in the in the vast river of stuff you know that individual piece of misinformation was not that impactful but it starts to make you wonder right is you know in a world where people are not going to run these articles through highly sophisticated ai algorithms to check whether or not they're real right they're they're just not right they're going to pick the thing that looks like what they want it to look like and those things are getting um Again, really, really impressive. And I think that while they are out of the reach of most folks, they're not out of the reach of state actors. In fact, for state actors, they're they're quite accessible. And, you know, I think the technology is not quite at a place where it's, uh, you know, an existential threat. But I, I, I don't know. I think it is getting close. I think that that's one of the biggest, uh, you know, short term threats that and sort of programmatic bias, I think, are some of the most uh, imminent threats that AI really poses. We all speak about social or political or geopolitical repercussions. Mm -hmm. What about business? Negative reper repercussions regarding uh, fake mirrors uh, on business as well? So I think that, you know, when I look at the biggest issue with uh, businesses right now, it's the really, really low success rate of AI projects, right? So I would say that, you know, today, um, you know, deep fakes, it's not a real threat to to most businesses, right? I would say that, you know, the adoption of AI is still really, really incomplete. I would say that, um, you know, at some point in the future, right, that might change, but that's not really the top issue for them. Right now, the top issue, uh, in my estimation at least, is really a skills gap is that when you look at the success rate uh, of AI projects uh, going into production uh, and then achieving the results that people believe they would achieve, it's something like 11% of projects actually get all the way through that process after mm. someone starts working on them. Uh, and you know, 11%, right? Which is wow. just awful. It's just like awful. abysmal. Um, and you know, a lot of the problem is actually kind of counterintuitive is because people believe that AI is sort of so easy because there's so much technology out there now, right? People sort of jump in without really devoting the necessary resources, then it's no wonder that it fails, right? Um, but I think that that skills gap, right? And that recognition that yes, you know, there are people and you know that the use cases are valuable enough individually that that 11% pays for, you know, the 90% that fails. So it's still, so it's still worth it for them, which is why everyone is still doing it. But I think that people are not necessarily recognizing that, you know, you don't have to have a failure rate that is that high. So for us, for instance, and, you know, we can, you know, we, we push our customers often pretty hard to say, Hey, look, you know, you framed this incorrectly. It's actually going to take you a little bit more work if you want to test these correctly. But uh, then on the flip side, we have a success rate of 97%. Right. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate, especially on the larger business side, is that, you know, you need more skills, right? Getting a couple of good partners plugged in actually can have a dramatically outsized impact. And, you know, I think that a lot of people just they don't measure or hold themselves accountable for is this getting into production? Right. Is this delivering the ROI that we thought it was going to deliver? Right. How long is it taking to get to production? Um, just because AI is so cool, I think, a, you know, people can be really loose with that. And I think that we really push people, you know, don't be loose with that. You know, be really, really clear because, uh, you know, we want people to be successful and, you know, we want folks that, you know, buy our solution to get promoted. I mean, 97 percent. What's the industry standard? 11 percent really ah that's yeah. that 11 percent and you are on 97. yeah 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 it's yeah oh, th yeah those are, those are comparable oh. numbers <laughs> oh my yeah God. it's no it's i mean it's i mean and that's and that's why we got into this business frankly you know and you know we had to fail a lot before we figured out how to do this uh but now you know it's a space that most people think has been around for three years or something for most people this space showed up when bird has arrived you know showed up but we've been doing this for eight years so you know we we've gotten pretty good at at doing it right
thrilled to say that we actually offer a free trial. We're one of the very few people in the industry to do this. So you can actually go to indicodata.ai right now. You can uh, play with an interactive demo live, even if you don't have your own documents or your own AI, and you can see it working uh, again live. And you can sign up for a more detailed trial where you'll actually get access to all of our production models. You'll get to see sort of our whole open source community. Uh, you know, you can follow me at slater.website. Uh, and I actually was just named, uh, as we mentioned at the start of the podcast, the Forbes 30 Under 30, so you can read more about us uh, in that press. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik.